Good evening, Malaysia and followers from around the globe. We are truly honored, and I really mean honored, to have with us Dr. Yasmin Muhammad. She is the original techie. Yasmin studied computer science and mathematics at a very early stage. She was there when the internet was born. Those were the days of the main, mainframe, the big machine and terminals the size of an aquarium, okay, which can really kill you if it drops from the sky. She, studied, she started her career as an analyst programmer before working her way up to, to be a CEO and as well as senior positions within Malaysia in Dell, Hewlett Packard and Microsoft. She was also the CEO for the Multimedia Development Corporation of Malaysia or MIDEC. Uh, she's a seasoned speaker at international forums such as the World Economic Forum and Fox uh, Forum. So uh, she's much sought after. Tonight, we will talk about the Netflix uh, documentary, The Social Dilemma, which is really a raging hot topic around the world among netizens. And that um, have we become the addicts, the users? Uh, and according to the documentary, the, the word users is only used to describe drug users and of course now the social media users. And that uh, have we gone on to the same level as these uh, addicts? I don't know. I think I'm one of them. I'm guilty as hell because when I wake up, the first thing I do is to grab the handphone. When I go to the uh, washroom, I grab the handphone. And before I sleep, I look, I had a final look at the uh, my phone, okay. So I'm actually glued. My wife says I play with the phone, but I say I work with the phone, okay. So uh, Yasmin, you are the expert. Share with us your thoughts on this uh, documentary. I think you have seen the uh, documentary, uh, which is trending like crazy around the world. Now, uh, what are your thoughts about this documentary? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. No, that's the mobile phone ringing, okay. Don't answer it, you're addicted. It's not, it's not my mobile phone, it's my landline actually. <laughs> the rare occasion where my landline actually is. Actually, so, so we, we, we're going to continue, right? Okay, yes, yes. Okay, so anyway, thank you so much, Yuwa. It's such a pleasure for me to be, to be here. Um, and um, I'm, a, well, you said it, I'm a veteran. I'm a 30 plus year old veteran from, uh, uh, and I am, a, I'm proud to say that I'm a tech geek. Yeah, I love technology and what it can do for people. So when you when you uh, uh, connected with me to talk about social dilemma, uh, the documentary, I was actually very pleased and very very happy about it. You know why? Because it is such an important topic, you know why? And I was uh, I was wondering, you know, everywhere in, in other parts of the world, in the U.S. and other countries, people are talking about it. You know, talk shows are, are, are interviewing and this and having a very intense discourse about what is uh, the, the subject of this uh, documentary but i hear that in malaysia we're not talking about it i don't i don't uh, i don't hear about it although now it is actually number one trending uh, on the netflix in malaysia so which is which is good so i hope that this can continue and i'm i'm also a bit nervous because um it's a very important topic uh, Malaysia is one of the top social media users. You know, the stats that I, I saw the last one was that 71% of a uh, Malaysian population are active social media users, right? And a lot of it is in the uh, in the age group, in the in the young age group, the most uh, the most uh, you know the most impressionable uh, you know uh, uh, category of our population. And for somebody like me who has been propagating technology um, you know I've been talking about the the, 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 the the benefits of technology and those still states you know I mean the the benefits of technology social media and what's coming in artificial intelligence those still exist but we can no longer and this is the subject of the documentary we can no longer ignore that the good side the good intentions as, as they say you know the the path to what the path to evil uh, the, the path to good intentions is the path to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So I think we are now at the point, and I'm, this, this social dilemma actually is bringing all that discussion to fore, and we must have this discussion, and I look forward to it uh, tonight. So Yasmin, do you think that uh, it was realistic or it was just simplistic in this documentary? 
Um, well, if you take away the fact that uh, there is some element of dramatization, of, obviously, and you take away that it is only looking at one side of the flip. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's all these two sides of the flip, uh, uh, you know, the two flips of the coin. It really did dives into the uh, negative impact um, that, is current, that is already currently happening. And more importantly, how this, 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 this ugly head can rear itself into a monster if we don't intervene, if we don't do something about it right now. So to answer your question, yes, there's, there's realities. Beneath all the dramatization of it, beneath the fact that it was only showing one side of the, of the story, the facts that were presented were too real, were very real, that it was, even for somebody like me, it was, it was, uh, it was of, of, of great concern. And it was very thought provoking. I felt that the Frankenstein approach uh, was a bit uh, over dramatic, but I, of course, uh, if, if there was no, none of this, uh, dramatic uh, impact or effect, uh, we would not be watching that documentary. Yes. No, but yes. um, uh, at the same time, it really uh, woke me up, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm not at the level of, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, of uh, social media anonymous. I can't be joining those clubs yet, okay? <laughs> but I, I think that I really cannot live without my social media platforms. And I'm 60 year old, okay? So my daughter consider me a dinosaur, okay? Uh, I force her to teach me, uh, but I really cannot live without my mobile phone. Okay, my wife challenged me and said, "Let's let's uh, delete all our apps." Okay, like what happened in the in the uh, in the documentary. I, I <laughs> don't want to take up the. You thing. can't. Yeah, you can't. You Especially can't. From a personal level, are you addicted to your phones and other devices? You know, before this, before watching this uh, documentary, I would be, I would say, nah, I don't think I am. Uh, you know, it's true though. The first thing that I, the last thing I, I, I do before I fall asleep is my phone. Look at my phone. And the first thing I do is uh, look at my phone. You know, my phone wakes me up. But from my cats, my phone wakes me up. My alarm is on my phone. But I would say, nah, I'm not. Because I spend about, uh, I was, I went, have you, how often do you check your screen time, should I? Well, very often, I dare not even check how much your usage that I use. I know, I dare not also. But in preparation for this, I actually went into check. So my average is about four hours, four and a half hours, which is slightly below the national average. You know what is the national average? What Malaysia's national average on the internet is actually 5.1 hours. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I'm slightly below average, but I... I think for anybody to say that you're not addicted to the phone, I mean, to, to social media and to our smartphone and our gadgets, that means we are in denial. Yes. Uh, you know, especially for the young population. Uh, it has become so much part of their life though, you know, that they have accepted this addiction. You know, I'm that's fine, you know. I'm, so what, what's wrong with it? If you talk to the young ones, they'll say what's wrong with it, right? Yeah. So, and this is where uh, the, the danger is. And for those of, for those that have not seen the uh, documentary, Chihuahua. Yeah, I, I just want to sort of like en encapsulate yeah. what the, the core essence of this documentary is, right? So let me start off with talking about the good side of social media, right? The good side of it is connecting everybody in the world. It is, has actually democratized information. Uh, we, we, you know, I always talk about the, the internet as my third brain. I say I have my left brain, I have my right brain, and I have my brain in the cloud. I don't, you know, I, I form my opinions. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't form any opinions without going to the internet to do search. People are getting matchmake on the internet. You know, people are finding lost, long families and connecting with friends. And the other part about social commerce, which is something that I pro propagated, you know, uh, when I was in government service, I propagated and how social commerce doing simple uh, Facebook marketing, Instagram marketing, how it had uplifted the economic. Uh, well-being of uh, families, of individuals, people who have never owned houses are now owning houses. So that is the good part of it. Now, what encompasses this whole phenomenon that has made 3 billion people all over the world so connected and so addicted to it, right? So basically, the, the crux of the ugly hit, as per the as what the, the documentary was saying, uh, was, trying, was trying to say is that on one part you have data. Data is indeed the new the new oil, right? And we have got data, the social media platforms now across are collecting data about us. 
about everything that we like, every time we hit a like, everything we make a comment, everything that everything that, that we do, every time that we make a purchase, all these are data collected. There was, uh, you know, they were during the, uh, 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 you know, the whole uh, fiasco uh, from the gener from the American elections by Cambridge Analytica. They say that they can they can easily get five thousand data points on any in individual. 5,000, that will make them know me, know us better than we know ourselves, right? Yeah. So on one hand is data and data is going to become even more prolific. Now, on the other part of it is just algorithms. Algorithms are being powered by supercomputers who are taking these data sets and they are writing codes, you know, that are, they are embedded into how we use social media platform. And the third component that makes up this ugly head is really the business model. Now we don't pay a single cent for using Facebook or Instagram, right? And that is why they say in the, in the book that if a platform is free, it means that you are the product. And the business, the, the business model is such that it lures you, it, it, it survives, it thrives on how long, how many people get onto the platform, how long you stay, and how long you get engaged, right? And uh, you know, you are giving KPIs to tech geeks to actually do this. Now, the analogy that I, I heard from one of the people in the, in the documentary was this, and it's a very scary one. If you imagine that a teacher, a teacher is only being measured on how much time your student spends with you right spends on learning what you want to teach so what do you do you fit the you fit your student with with uh, with with sweets with drugs you feed the students with what they want to hear we, and you 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 prey on their deepest emotions of fear of insecurities and if nobody is governing you you will continue to do so without looking at the repercussions beyond your KPIs I think what he says is very true. We seem to have gone into an era where we seem to be quite happy with the uh, number of followers that we have. And the yes. more followers we have, we get more excited. And the reality is that we never get out of our house and our kids have actually very few real friends. Okay, They only have exactly. friends and followers on the social media, which they do not really know. And I, I think know. that's the sad part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I have a 24-year-old son and... Uh, and we, you know, he will kill me if he knows I'm discussing. About <laughs> it. But, you know, but we have discussed exactly that a few weeks ago. Um, you know, I was encouraging him that you gotta, because he studied overseas and therefore he has to make the effort to make friends here because, you know, you don't have the organic friends from university, right? Yeah. So I said, you, you, must, you, must, you must make an effort to go and meet friends and make friends. I said, oh, but mama, I've got lots of friends. You know, I got, I got my friends who I discuss about my, my love for architecture. I have friends I discuss about my love for citizen and things, you know. And, um, and I said, okay. So he's, he argued about that, you know. And then one time I was going, I was asking about some of his friends. I want, you know, I wanted to go in into his platform. And he said, oh, no, mama, please don't, uh, don't, don't make a comment. They don't even know who, what my real name is. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. They're not your real. I mean, how can you call them friends when they they don't even know your real name? But in the young generation, friends have a totally different meaning. It's about your Facebook friends. It's about your Instagram friends. You know, and they that to them is not addiction. To them, that that's fine. I grew up in that environment. You know. So, but I think what's important right now is for them to understand that what that has got them hope that hope to this kind of behavior is a movement that I talked about. This, 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 you know, I mean, okay, I'm a big, big dramatic, but there's a monster, really, a monster that is collecting data, a monster that is creating algorithms and all without any uh, consideration for anything else but to make more money. So I think they need to understand that when would persuasive you know because they try to persuade you no know, yeah it's fine they're they pushing me as they're trying to persuade me but when would persuasive techniques become manipulative techniques because you know then you are subjected to being manipulated when would you know filtered reality 
becomes orchestrated reality. And I think that is not something that the young ones would even have the interest nor the attention to digest. So I think it's up to us, you know, the older generation who understands this to somehow figure out how do we trigger this sense of concern with this sense of urgency towards what's happening. You know, Yasmin, uh, both of us come from an era where we use a landline and we still keep our landline. You know, yes. that during our time... As you saw just now, <laughs> when my could, landline phone rang. We could actually rely on the landline, the bosses could not reach us and we could not reach our bosses. And many of the households did not have a landline. My house did not have a landline growing up in Penang. And that uh, when we wanted to uh, date a girl, okay, we had to go to the grocery shop, pay the guy 20 cents and make that phone call. Okay, now that was how it was done. And now let's not talk about the young people. Okay, we are older people and yet we have gone from landline and not to a stage where we really need to answer all the emails on our mobile phone because if we do not answer them, it will run to hundreds and thousands of them and we should feel very burdened, okay? So yeah. let's not talk about the young, let's talk about ourselves. And I've realized <laughs> that retirees are actually quite horrible, okay? No, I've realized that in the chat group among the retired people in the 60s and 70s, they, they follow a lot of fake news, okay? Because yeah. they are not in yeah. touch with what's happening in the corporate world or in real life. So they yeah. rely entirely on what's in the chat group now. Okay, we can tell the younger people, okay, you got to control yourself. What do we tell older people? Yeah, so, you know, I think for the older generation, and, and I have this discussion again with my husband all the time, you know, there is this complete trust on the internet. You know, I mean, how many times do you hear grown up, I mean, educated, intel intelligent grown ups who say that uh, I heard it on the internet? Yeah. So, and, and, and you know, this is the power of the, and, and this, is, this is what's going to happen, this algorithm, it, uh, algorithms will basically churn out information and, uh, you know, and that was what, another topic that was, that was discussed in the, in the documentary, actually, this is about the information versus affirmation, right? So, go, you know, going back to, 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 to fake news, um, fake news is a phenomena that is becoming almost criminal, um, you know, in, um, in, is in, is, it is intended. And a lot of times it's unintended fake news, you know, like your friends and my friends who heard something and we'll just, you know, we just forward it. That's why, right? yeah. uh, Even valid, validating. Previously, we have news from like your publication, you know, and you know, we are very, you are accountable for it. You know, that means if yeah. you were to, put in a fake news, there could be defamation. But with the internet, you know, the anom anonymity of it, you know, you could just simply pure outrightly lie. Um, you know, I, I remember whether, because I'm the chairman, I'm currently the chairman of Post Malaysia, and I don't know whether people remember, there was this big, huge outcry about a postman that didn't get his bonus and was caught sitting down crying by the sidewalk. And you know, there was a huge outcry over it. There was a petition that got, I think something like 40,000 of uh, signatories to say, please, please uh, pay, pay up, you know, the, the bonus. And, and, the, and, and this got viral, you know, even my own personal Twitter accounts, I had to go off the grid for a while because it was just getting too, too vicious, you know, the, the kind of uh, comments that I was getting, but you know, it was all orchestrated. It was all a, a, a scam, you know. It was all just somebody coming up there to create this whole drama to get the um, to get uh, donations, and they eventually managed to get in, uh, donations from very generous, although gullible, you know, Malaysians, yeah. right? And police report was made. Eventually, it was uh, within within a matter of couple of weeks. I mean, less less than a less than a couple of weeks, slightly more than a week. It was unraveled, and it was uh, the police made the statement that it was all a scam and so on. But you know what? That news that it was actually fake news yeah. did not even get any level of virality. Yes. Nobody forwarded it. It was just died down. So fake news apparently gets viral out six times more than than real news. Yes. You know, so I think that is the issue. How do you stop it? I think I'm educating my friends mm -hmm. and my and my own husband to say that it doesn't mean that when you receive it, 
that just because you receive it, you don't have any accountability. Yeah. That accountability to forward to whomever, it is still yours. Yes. So, you know, in Islam, we call fitnah, right? Fitnah is one of the deeper sins that, that, yeah. that, that, that you can have. And if you do that, that is being a party to fitnah. So I keep reminding that you know, to all my friends. You know that, Yasmin, <laughs> you, uh, in a documentary, everybody talks about algorithm, big data. And I know that you, one of your most uh, passionate uh, topic has always been artificial intelligence. Now, uh, has AI come to a point where it has become a reality? It's already fast and furious in your words, and it's yeah. really moving fast ahead. Um, what is happening with uh, AI application in Malaysia? Uh, how yeah. well or how bad are we doing? Well, AI, yes, it is becoming mainstream. It is going to come, it has come in fast and furious. And, you know, Malaysia as a country, we need to tap on this, if anything at all, just to survive in the economic global ecosystem. You know, P PwC has uh, uh, made a report to say that uh, AI adoption can actually impact or uplift the economic GDP of a country from anything from 14% to 26%, which means that I think at the global level, by, by the year 20, 2030, uh, and at a global level, it could mean anything from $3.5 trillion in terms of uh, uh, uplifted uh, economic impact. So, you know, Malaysia, we are part of the global economy. We have to adopt it. And I have been a big propagator for it. I'm very excited about the technology that the tech geek side of me has been very excited about what it can do you know i mean it's able to uh, predict um, um, cancer better than even doctors how ai can augment um, you know augment uh, 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 human intelligence you know it's, it's an exciting topic but i'm also been talking about and i i have to talk more about it is and advocate more about it on the on the potential pitfalls on the pitfalls of of uh, AI, um, you know, one part is about the impact of the job change. You know, I mean, yes. job jobs will be created, but ex but it will it will change. So existing jobs will make way for new jobs, and if we do not make, if we do not orchestrate that leap, you know, I mean, I always give the example about when cars replaces horses, when or carriages replaces horses, right? or cars with his horses. So, you know, there are a lot of the horse people who were rearing horse, who were doing all the, you know, what was it, the horseshoe or all this yeah, place. Yeah. But it also makes up for, you know, mechanics, you know, car yeah. mechanics, garage and so on. So if you don't make the transition, it could be a massive, massive societal impact. So that is one impact of AI, which is on the jobs, you know, the, the what I call the sharp drop, the sharp chasm. In, uh, in, in jobs displacement. The other one you know, is also very, very um, crucial, which is about the governance and transparency and accountability of AI, which actually lies in algorithms, which is what we are seeing right now. You know, one of the, the key things which, um, you know, we, we now see a lot of polarization. I mean, if you think about the US, which is the center of te technology, right? And there's a lot of polarization. Of course, there must already be that seeds of polarization that happens but yes. social media and the algorithms are amplifying it at a rate that is making it where we are today and this is an, this is an example that was given in the documentary right yes so it is about the fact that you you know when 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 you click on a particular you know when you are giving two particular content two different content you will go to you will be lured to look into something that you already have the inclination towards right then once it understands the algorithm understands it it will start to feed you more of similar content so if you are already a left a leftist in the us for instance right mm -hmm. then you will continue to go down that route and you will not even understand yeah. the other the other side or the, the other uh, uh, the other uh, dimension of the equation, right? So I think they give an example. If you were to say type in climate change is yes. in a search, 
you will, if, if you're already inclined towards environmental sustainability, then you will say climate change is impacting the, uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the source for all these, uh, uh, you know, floods and, and, and earthquakes and so on. But if you are already tending towards uh, the other side, then when you do the search, the search will, the, the first search that will come up is climate change is a hoax. Yes. Right. So then you will continue to be polarized. And this, if unchecked, is going to create to what you are seeing currently in the US, you know, which is really, really scary. You know, so I think this is the, the ugly side of algorithms. And when you bring to AI, you know, and there's a TED talk that, that, that I did, and I give a simple example of, you know, when you are in a, in a drive, you know, when AI will power driverless car in the future, right? And uh, when the when you are you know when you are come across a dog that crosses the road, right? And then on the left hand side is a guy. Is a guy that is uh, an old guy that is on a cane. On the other side is a child with a ball. So, what does the car do? Do you brake and save the dog, yeah. or do you swerve to the left to save the 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 the, the kid? Or do you swerve to the right to save the old man? Now, who makes those decisions? Is it the, you know, it's, it's no longer in that, you know, it's no longer in you who are in driving that car. It is in algorithm. Now, who makes, what is the algorithm? Algorithms are now being used to do college admissions. Algorithms are being used to look into parole. Algorithms are being used for everything, right? So who makes, what, what kind of biases prejudices that has been embedded into those algorithms. It's transparent right now. It's like lawless. It's like nobody knows. It's like a black hole. And that is the danger of AI. And nobody knows how to regulate them or who can regulate them effectively. It's free for all. Yeah, it's free for all. You know, So that's the danger. Okay, Yasmin, I have this question because you spoke about uh, the uh, necessity to create jobs uh, that can fit in uh, for the future for Malaysia. Okay, now. You know that uh, it came to my mind that the the gypsies, okay, they were very good horsemen, and then that they did not uh, learn new traits. The cars came, and of course, we know that many of them have been reduced to become beggars and criminals, okay, because yeah. they did not learn how to upskill themselves. And yeah. uh, uh, during our time, everybody wants to be a lawyer, everybody wants to be a doctor, okay. Uh, nobody yeah. thought that you can actually make a lot of money by becoming a chiropractic uh, experts okay, or specialists. Now. Um, what kind of uh, jobs do you think that uh, would be uh, necessary 10 years from now, 5 years from now, and how well has our government and our universities prepared our kids to be relevant mm -hmm. in the coming years? I know that um, at one point, under the PM, PMO's office, there was this uh, uh, Geno Genovasi, agency Genovasi, okay? Uh, it was an agency set up to talk about uh, what kind of... Uh, people that we want to uh, to train or to create, what courses are relevant anymore? Do we still have yeah. this kind of agency that looks into jobs for the future? Yeah, well, I can't comment on that. I'm no longer in government. So I think there's- You're no longer in government. government, you can comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, true. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so, um, you know, okay. First of all, this whole discussion here is I think one of the most, uh, critical discussions that we got to have. And when I was in government, it was something that I had a sense of responsibility, you know? I mean, what 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 do you do to uh, like switch a proof? And if you take it even at, uh, I mean, my, our kids, I mean, uh, you know, my, uh, my our generation's kids, they already grown up, right? So, but what do we do about kids uh, in schools right now? You ask, what kind of jobs will there be in five years, 10 years? You know what? Nobody knows. And that is the, that is the key challenge. How do you prepare talent for a goalpost that hasn't been defined or at the very least a goalpost that is moving? So, um, you know, so there will be, I mean, when three years ago, when I was giving examples about this, I was talking about drone pilots. Yes. And at that time, drone pilots was just like a job of the future. But guess what? Now it's already a job current. Yes. <laughs> it's already a current, uh, you know, current job. We were talking about uh, just recently, I saw this uh, somebody in the doc in the documentary. I think the one of the ladies there, she is now an algorithm uh, audit. She set up a firm 
that looks into algorithm audits. Now, who would have thought that that could be such a profession? Yeah. What, even one year ago, right? Um, so, yeah, I can't answer that, you know. If you ask me even three years, I can't even answer with certainty. So I've come to the conclusion, into my own personal opinion, mm -hmm. that you cannot prepare for jobs. Yeah. You've got to have skills, right? So when you talk about skills, and you talk about what are the skills that you absolutely need for, a, for an environment of destructive innovation. I mean, holistically, it's going to be destructive because drone pilots disrupted jobs. But they are currently also being disrupted because there's this autonomous, this, this AI will then displace drone pilots, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, how then do you, what kind of skills do you, do you need in a world where disruption has to be the norm? So I've come to some conclusion. So mm -hmm. the first one is basically um, problem solving skills. Yeah. You know, we have got to teach our kids from young to get into problem solving skills. Yes. And then it's about communication and collaborating skills, collaboration skills, which is something that Malaysia is really, really struggling with. You know, it's not about English. People, we talk about this and people think it's English language. No, even if you ask them to communicate in BM or to communicate yeah. in Mandarin, what they're most comfortable with, they can't communicate. They yeah. just can't put forward their ideas. So I think the second part is communication, which even leads to, even we're talking about storytelling, you know, so yeah. problem solving, communication, um, you know, those are some of the key um, uh, uh, soft skills. And then I'm a big, I'm a big um, proponent for coding skills, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm a computer science graduate, you know, and whatever I learned in programming in those, in those days, you, you were right, it's like beach mainframes that would drop from the sky kind of thing, right? But uh, the, the, the skills that I learned in programming, which is basically how do you take a problem and you, you structure it in a way that allows you to solve the problem. Then you write the code, you know, and then you go have it compiled and then you have to debug. Debugging also is part of the problem solving skills, right? So the problem solving skills brings in so much of a different kind of a, a thinking process that still, that the discipline of it still stays with me until, until today. So I think those are some of the bets that I would take, um, you know, to prepare the people for uh, our, our, our talent for the future. Yasmin, I'm glad you brought up the question of coding because I think coding is so necessary for our kids, okay? Now, yeah. so that comes to the question of democratization of education in digital. Uh, if you stay in Bangsa, you stay in KL, you stay in Penang, you know, that you have access to these uh, coding classes, uh, which is widely conducted in Klang Valley. And then that with this um, COVID-19 situation, if you stay in an urban area, you can have online classes. Most of the kids have their desktop or their iPad now. Yeah. What happens yeah. to the kids in the rural areas? They can't attend even the tuition class, okay? Forget about coding. Uh, where does that leave them? Yeah, so, so you know, the, 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 the promise of this, the internet uh, was to democratize the, you know, the, the wealth, um, the access to education, and by that virtue also will then, um, the promise of it was to reduce the, education gap and the wealth gap and so on. But the premise is, that promise is based on one premise, which yeah. is access, yeah. you know, just access. So I think every country now, um, you know, struggles to give, uh, to make sure that there is access. In Malaysia, I think it's pretty decent. I'm, I'm no longer in government, so I don't have to say this, yes, but please. I think they're pretty decent. They're pretty decent <laughs> in terms of access. Of course, there are still challenges. I mean, I think we have gone, I can't, I do, I can't remember, uh, but it's pretty high. Uh, hang on, I think I may have the note somewhere that our internet penetration, um, I think, has gone out to be pretty pretty high. Our mobile penetration, in fact, is about 145% right now. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's pretty, it's, it's pretty high. But um, of course, the speed and, and, and affordability is, 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 is one part of it. But this is the... The premise of it. I mean, it's like you're trying to become an industrialized uh, nation if you don't have electricity. Yeah. Right. So, I think this is the one part to make sure that there is access. That is the government's role. There's nothing that anybody can do, yeah. uh, but the, only the government can do this, which is to provide access. Right. But the rest of it, I think, if you if you look at even um, and this is it is a, a concern that I have as well in our society in particular in Malaysia. Um, you know, what do they use the internet for? Um, 
do they use how many how many actually use it to go to the various online um, courses free mm -hmm. online courses or do they go there to look at you know the latest scandal from the artists you know that in uh, our social social media you know we have these influencers yeah. and influencers i think take up and we are very influential I, I was just looking some digging just now you know do you know that our top influencer who's our top influencer on facebook right now who nilofa wow okay nilofa and the top 10 of facebook influencers are all women i see all women right and they all selling something ever came in. Yeah. So I think so. There's a lot of time being spent on consuming content from the influencers, which is good from the perspective that it is creating the social commerce. You know, I, I call it the Mambawang economy. You know, <laughs> you know the Mambawang, right? I mean, the Mambawang, you, you, you gossip about things. And when you gossip about something, you get so much attention and then you monetize this attention. Similarly to what, I mean, this is the, the basic crux of a social media business model, right? You, yeah. you can monetize the attention and you monetize the mambawangness you know the more the more you can get people to be active then the more you can monetize so i think malaysians are doing that but it's at the ex it has gone to, to a certain extent and the good side is that it's creating like i said you know uh, economic empowerment for a whole community of people but yeah. on the other part i think it's so overpowering now that that the other elements like education is taking a back seat so i think that is something that we need to uh, talk about you know i think to solve any problem like what, what we're trying to do right now is to have to acknowledge as a problem and to um you know and to uh to to have a, a, a an open discourse about it you know and people like us you know grown-ups on the, on, on the table sometimes have to come in and provide although we are an overwhelmingly minority in this whole internet economy Right. But I think we've got to make our voices heard. And, you know, for people like you and me who are in the old generation, but somewhat connected to the young generation, because we are in a way quite active social media um, and quite active Internet users. Right. Uh, I think we, we, we need to have some sense of responsibility and, and, and accountability to um, at least have these discussions like what we're doing right now uh, yeah. to come to form. I think that the content is really important, that social media is a platform and the tool that we use, we really need to enrich the content. You get an example of uh, celebrities, uh, which are the most, uh, what they call it, most popular among our Malaysian social users. I, it came to my mind, uh, some guy who has got maybe half a million or one million followers, and he has got a very popular uh, talk show, okay? I mean, when I look at the content, it was like, okay, uh, uh, Westerners who can speak to Mandarin, uh, who farts the loudest? Really, who farts the loudest, okay? And that, oh, that number is really a million. I'm like, hello, this Malaysia uh, is unbelievable. But uh, that's what people look for. And uh, you know, the, the amount of fake news this, this morning um, in many of the chat groups that I received since the announcement of the uh, MCO, okay, yeah. CMCO, okay, whatever, okay. And that, there was this uh, uh, Instagram that went around quoting, purportedly quoting the Community Kesihatan Malaysia. And it says that. Um, 80 to 90 percent of these COVID 19 cases happens in shopping malls and in uh, eateries. So, of course, like someone who has been trained in journalism, I know that's not how Kabantian people speak, okay? <laughs> they yeah. don't speak like we speak, okay? It has got to be a certain structure. So, I call uh, our DG. He says, No, there's no such thing. But it was flying around in all the chat groups. So, as you said, it's easily, um, uh, we're easily duped, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, we do not check our contents. We do not check what we receive. We are still at their level. I don't know whether it's just Malaysia or around the world that people. No, I, no yeah, I think world, right? news is massive. It's, it's, a, it's a massive issue all over the world. And I think, I think there must be some level of accountability. And we cannot solve this. I mean, they were when, when you talk about fake news, the techies will come and say, oh, we're going to apply technology to, to, yeah. to look at it. Technology cannot solve this, you know. Technology cannot solve it 100%. Some of it, but not 100%. It's got to be societal behavior. It's got to be some level of governance. And, you know, for somebody who is like in development of technology, I cringe at the word of regulation, but there must be some level of regulation. You know what I mean? Media, the media advertising. I mean, people people always think that, you know, the, the culprit here is the advertising agency. 
yes, they are the one that is consuming a lot of, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a consumption. It's a one trillion US dollar uh, industry, by the way, globally. Yeah? So, you know, but the the advertising industry is an age old industry, Juwai, you know that. I mean, we've been trying, the, the advertisements have been trying to manipulate, have been trying to influence, you know, um, people's thoughts towards their products. So that, that has been, that has been ongoing throughout. But what's different this time around is the fact that we don't even know that we are being, we are trying to be influenced. It yeah. is so, you know, it is so embedded into our behaviors, you know, and, um, and, and that is the danger. So I think there must be some sense. The, the broadcast or the media industry has been the, one of the most highly regulated industry in the past, correct? I mean, you should know. Yes. Right? I mean, you get, you get scrutinized for everything, right? Yeah. And you, but right now, the media, the social media is the biggest media in the world. And there is no level of valid, validation. There's no level of accountability. And, you know, self-generated content is becoming the content right now. And self-generated is behind anonymity. I can come out and put up whatever name and I can become a keyboard warrior, you know, you know what, what, what they call keyboard warriors, you know, people who can charge there, you know, but you see in person, then you cringe. And that is a very dangerous, <laughs> yeah. you know, so I think there must be, it's time for some level of regulation. Um, I think it will have to start and to make things more complex, you know, why is the fact that, you know, the tech companies, they are in the US, right? Mm -hmm. But 70% yeah. of, for instance, Facebook users are outside of the US. So that's why, you know, if you dramatize it, we're talking about digital colonization, you know, this is a new era of colonization. Okay, but we, we put aside the, the drama of it, right? But mm. the, the fact of the matter is what can we do in Malaysia when the tech companies are in the US and subjected yeah. to US um, regulations? You want to shut out Facebook? You can't. You can't shout out the social media platforms. You can't shout out Google because it has brought a lot of good impact as well. So I think that is, uh, you know, I mean, if you think about it, you know why that social media really come into this, came to full bearing, full mainstream, what, in the year 2000, in 2010, yeah, 2010 to 11. So it's been 10 years. So it's been 10 years, right, of this innovation that has taken us by storm. So I think now what we are looking at right now is as an inflection point where we will have to go back and we will have to take stock. And taking stock has to be at every level, not only at the tech giants. Uh, you know, I think that the, the, the tech giants, I was told, I'm not sure, I'm not validated this, you know, I was told that Instagram uh, has actually uh, now de-linked de likes from their advertising algorithms. Um, you know, and this is to, because likes, yeah, this whole phenomenon of likes is actually redefining a person's self-worth yes. and identity. So I think they understood that this is becoming a bit too uh, influential, you know, so they have taken it out. So I've not validated that, but so that means the tech companies and Facebook after that whole uh, Cambridge Analytica, you know, they have also put in some, a lot more of uh, uh, privacy settings and, 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 you know, putting more power in the hands of the users. So I think the tech companies have to have some conscience and you see in this documentary you know it is coming from the people who actually were building the social media from across you know from google from facebook from from all this uh you know from all these uh, companies right so they now have got this develop a conscience and are now coming up to speak about it so i think so that's good from the tech companies themselves i think from us from from the users we also need to do our part and the government also need to do our part you know, but there, there was an interesting thought, though, Chinua, if, if, if I may, sure. right? It's an interesting thought about, can we put the genie back in the bottle? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Can you put the genie back in the bottle? Yeah. And, and not, in the, in, not in the sense of cutting it off, because you can, you know, like say, you know, your life is so embedded into it. But for instance, if you were to say that Facebook is no longer completely free, mm. right? Yeah. You have to pay for certain elements of uh, what 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 Facebook does, so maybe it will Facebook will will take a tumble for a while, 
you know, um, but it will rebound just like the way it rebounded with the Cambridge Analytica thing. You know, it only took three, it tumbled 24% in March 2018, and then it rebounded back, recovered everything in May. You know, so, but if we were to make that consider, okay, you know, it's not purely for profit. What if social media companies become social enterprises? They will never. <laughs> Because capitalism is the almighty. <laughs> you know, Yasmin, I've, I've got a grudge to mention about this Facebook. Okay, now, 80% uh, of all the ads in Malaysia now goes to Facebook. Okay, now, and that the other media companies take up 15% or 20%. And this is the worst part. For the last three, four years, we have got changed. We have changed government three times, four times, I don't know. Okay, at, at every budget, uh, they have this pre-budget talks with the finance ministry and I will tell them, please tax Google, okay? Please tax Facebook. We pay okay. taxes and they pay zero, zero taxes, okay? The Vietnamese yeah. government have gone after Facebook. Australian governments have gone after Facebook. In Malaysia, yeah. nothing. We have done yeah. nothing and we're looking for money, okay? So taxpayers do not have to pay. Facebook should pay. Okay, now the second point I want to bring up is this. Uh, you mentioned about the availability of content. You know Facebook is just like a, or social media is like a sort, it's a double-edged thing, how you use it, okay? Now, um, like many Malaysians, okay? Uh, well, there are those who watch the uh, celebrities. I actually watch a lot of uh, the preaching by independent preachers, okay? And I mean uh, Muslim preachers. I'm a big fan of uh, Ustaz Ibn Liu, okay? Now, Ustaz Ibn Liu was unheard of, okay? Some years back. And he cleverly used the... Uh, the social media and his content was fresh, very positive, not very multiracial, and was very good. And then suddenly the other competitors felt very threatened, okay? Because I know their level of content, okay? I will talk about the level of content. Now, when I look at Ibilu, the content was good, okay? And he uses social media. So I think that in Malaysia, it's a question of as more and more um, information is available throughout the social media, I think we'll be able to judge, and I hope we will grow up fast and soon that you'll be able to judge the quality of content that's available on social media. And I think that, uh, I know we have a Frankenstein, but in Adam's family, Frankenstein is a good guy, okay? So, Yasmin, I have a final uh, question for you. Now, um, what will be um, your thoughts now that people have uh, watched Netflix, people have uh, talked about it, and as you said that, uh, you know, uh, the Facebook controversy uh, over Oxford Analytics was just three months, okay? Will we learn anything out from this or are we just going to be back to business as usual and we're going to be stuck in this uh, predicament? Yeah, I think um, there's a very high chance that, you know, this will just blow over, right? Because, you know, now there is a lot of I, I really urge for those that have not watched it to to to, to go and watch it. It's really, really, um, it's really very real and very thought pro provoking, right? So, but I, I you know, I worry, you know, why that it will just blow over, right? But uh, then it will come back again, you know, just like people now talking about Cambridge Analytica again because of the social dilemma, because the problem will not go away, right? So the question now is, you know, there is this: what do we do? And I say we have to do it at at our level. Yes. Uh, what, in whatever way in our personal capacity, you know, like for me, for instance, I have vouched that I will be talking more about this. Yes. You know, I will not, I will, I will, I will, I will still have my enthusiasm and I still believe in like Facebook is doing a lot of good, you know, AI will do a lot of good uh, and I'll continue to propagate that, right? Because yes. that is the innovation for good. But we have to also balance it up. And that's what I want to do. I'm going to, to talk about this. I'll continue to talk about this if I have the platforms. And I would suggest you why that, and I know you will, and I hope that we will not get sucked into the fact that, oh, it's no longer popular, therefore we don't talk about it. Yes. You know. So I think we have, uh, we have a responsibility to actually continue to talk about this. And I'm actually, even in, in Malaysia right now, not, apart from this, you know, I don't think anybody else is talking about it. So maybe there is still the upward curve towards having this, uh, this discussion. Um, I think we need to apply, uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to also have the government, I think we need to also champion this. It is not the most popular thing to champion in a way, because as you can see, this is what's happening in other parts of the world, in Brexit, in the US, you know, governments themselves are, used, are taking advantage of this 
yes. to for their own political gains, right? So, um, but I always believe that you know there is more good in this world than the bad. So, but a lot of times the bad guys are more are the ones that are more creative. You know, the good guys are more of the sidelines. So I think hopefully in this scenario, you know, the good guys will also come forward. Um, you know, to be more engaged. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, we must have you back again to talk about other related issues. Okay, okay. now it will be my pleasure. Thank you. thank you. Now here's a here's the paradox. Okay, please remember to like, follow, and share Real Chunwai, and follow Yasmin <laughs> on social media. Thank you. <laughs> thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you, Yasmin. Good night. Thank you.